Good evening and thank you for joining me. This series of programs is to be about the story of the week, its media treatment, its real significance, and a few matters of opinion. But it won't always be like that. This week, however, it will. The death of the great batsman brought an unguarded revelation from the former Mr Australia, given the where were you when you heard JFK had been killed treatment on Radio 3AK. What were you doing when you heard the news? Yeah, I was actually, uh, I was shaving, I heard early morning yesterday, and uh, I knew that I'd been in Adelaide on Friday. Sorry, Ray, did you say you were shagging? He certainly did. We all heard him. The news broke early Monday morning, and the cashing in started within minutes. The parrot was hard at it, flogging a CD, this CD. Sir Donald Bradman. A tribute. Presented by Alan Jones. Its contents are three Bradman songs and seven tracks read by Alan Jones. All that sibilance and gabbling for just 1995. It's a snip. Here's the pitch. But we also here at uh, TUE released an album of those comments that I'd made, extracts from many of the testimonials that I had delivered to Sir Donald, often in his presence when he was alive. At the same time, hardheads at Fairfax were cobbling together a special afternoon edition of the Sydney Morning Herald. Pretty cheeky stuff. By adding just three stories, two from their obituary files and one bought in from the London Telegraph, they flogged the same paper all over again, a dollar ten a pop. Other morning papers to cash in with afternoon specials were the Adelaide Advertiser and the Melbourne Age. By Tuesday, of course, all the obituary files had been emptied out, all the old photographs had been scanned in, and all the baby boomers had recounted their personal brushes with Bradman's fame. If a tribute band is a self-confessed counterfeit, what does that make a tribute edition? Special tribute edition. Special tribute edition. A 12-page tribute. Plus 8-page special tribute. The economic rationalists at Fairfax engaged in some admirable recycling. The cover of their 1998 Herald Tribute Edition on the occasion of Bradman's 90th birthday reappeared in the form of a Tribute Edition. It was an opportunity no newspaper could afford to miss. A tribute. A tribute. Tribute Edition. Print trailed television by 12 hours. The same hyperbole, naturally, and all from reporters who never saw him play, let alone lived through the Depression. They universally credited him with conquering. ABC TV had the regulation sad read. But Bradman's legacy is far greater than any statistics can show. A humble and private man, he inspired a nation when it hit the depths of the Depression. He passed away at his home in Adelaide yesterday morning. A cricketer who united a nation and earned a unique place in history. The 25th of February 2001 will go down as the day we lost a national treasure. One man had no greater impact on a nation than Sir Donald Bradman. Channel 10, so in tune with its audience, has illiterates for reporters. The in-depth current affairs shows went no deeper than repeating the clichés and nobody seemed to notice how unrelentingly blokey it was all becoming. Women ceased to exist and we were all boys making a hundred in the backyard at Mum's. The statistics alone don't even begin to measure the full impact of the Don on Australian life. During the grim years of the Great Depression, he carved out a special place in his nation's history. When Farlap died tragically in 1932, it was Don Bradman who carried the burden of Australian hopes at a time when the nation desperately needed heroes. Yes, but that's hardly wait for age. With his big country boy smile, Bradman helped pull Australia through some of our darkest days. When everything else seemed lost, the Don showed us how to win. Nice of them to give Ray a gig. Gives him something to do between Christmas carols telecasts. Not only was the Bradman coverage unremittingly blokey, but it was equally about manufacturing consensus. A nation mourns. 
The Don, a nation mourns. Nation mourns Sir Don Bradman's death. Nation mourns. Nation mourns the Don. No, Illawarra Mercury, we haven't forgotten you. We shall not look upon his like again. We shall not look upon his like again. The Fairfax Herald's leader eulogised Bradman because he... was self-taught, took quiet pride in achievement, and never, ever cashed in. Arrant nonsense. What about the bats, the boots, and the broadcasts? Tune into our Don, who broadcasts exclusively. Together with Uncle Lionel and the Listerine Serenaders. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that the Herald is making it up. The Australian's leader writer was sick the day they did tautologies. Bradman's appeal is based on a nostalgia for the past. And it took a POM, the London Daily Mail's cricket columnist Ian Waldridge, to point to a few warts for Murdoch. Curious, isn't it, that he wasn't hugely liked. Sycophants surrounded him in shoals, but in his own Australian teams, the Catholics hated him. And as for his never, ever cashing in... Sir Donald, in those ageless days, was not averse to autographing 5,000 brand new cricket bats at a shilling a time. Alan Ramsey made the same point about Bradman and his Catholic teammates, but added... I'm never sure why Australians need their heroes so pristine, yet all those acres of newsprint and countless hours of broadcast gush, mostly from people who knew only the legend, seem a greater sadness than Bradman's death. Donald Horne wanted to praise Bradman, but not for the qualities falsely attributed to him. Another myth to scrape off is that when the nation was in desperate need of a hero during the Depression, Bradman lifted hopes and spirits and helped save the social fabric from splitting. I don't think that in the Depression years, Australians were as stupid as that. Ray Martin and Peter Luck do. One of the most interesting aspects of this Stop the Nation Bradman's Dead phenomenon is its failure to engage women. We could only find one to write about that, Deborah Jones in The Oz. Like many women, I quite enjoy a decent game of cricket, but this week's death of the Don has left me completely unmoved. For women of a certain age, Bradman is an emblem of the times when men's business was always more important than women's business. Older women accepted that. Younger women know it isn't true. She particularly refers to the Prime Minister's personal distress, but I'll come back to that later. The real point about all this cynical gushing must surely be its utter irrelevance to present-day Australia. Manning Clark's Ur text of our history devotes 38 pages to the place of cricket in the Australian culture of Bradman's day. It was certainly not just a game. And there are multiple references to the then Bob Menzies appropriation of cricket, but preferably in England. In London, he felt ashamed of Australians, of their coarseness, their lack of reading, their ignorance, their lack of interest in old civilization, and their lack of graciousness. But he kept it as best he could to himself. Menzies used cricket to create a false image of himself as one of the boys, and he used Bradman in the process, getting him to captain a Prime Minister's eleven that included Richie Benno against Ted Dexter's side at Manuka in 1963. But those were the days of Saturday afternoon tennis in the suburbs, rugby crowds in tweed jackets and club ties, and the man in white is always right, the monocultural fifties, when John Landy, thinking he may have tripped Ron Clark on the bend, stopped and went back to check he was all right before resuming and winning the race. That is not the Australia of 2001. Television sport is the opium of sedentary suburbia, the revenue stream of Channel 9 and Foxtel, and winning is all that matters. What was it Ray Martin praised Bradman for? The Don showed us how to win. Winning is all. It's a sad point to have reached for a country that always believed a catastrophic loss at Gallipoli was its baptism. Hence, Leighton Hewitt's spoilt brat behaviour is acceptable, so long as he's a winner. Well done! Well done! What a great point! And an Olympic gold medal in Taekwondo is to be a matter of national celebration, even if, to the uninitiated, it's a boring contest between bad-tempered women trying to kick each other in the breasts. And she's done it! 
Lauren Burns from Melbourne, the 26-year-old, has won a gold medal for Australia. We are the greatest, and we certainly don't approve of this sort of thing. It's Canute. Oh, Gerard comes a long way, and he had to be served. Not anymore. Anyway, the Australian soccer team loses, so we can't be expected to follow them. John Howard is nothing else if not a politician, and name-dropping is all part of the business. And also uh, a wonderful afternoon that uh, Jeanette and I spent with Don and Jesse at their home in Adelaide in 1997. It's supposed to humanise him. Mark Taylor put an end to that. Um, here's a cricket tragic, I think we call him in the change rooms. I, 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 I hope you can call the Prime Minister Cricket tragic, because he is. Not only is cricket irrelevant to the majority of Australians in 2001, women, by and large, and non-Anglos, it, despite how frequently the Australian team wins test matches, is played in a way that justifies no such thing as national pride. As Merv Hughes and Tim May left the field during a break for rain, a spectator made a comment to Hughes. This was the result. The match referee fined them both $450. Today, the Australian Cricket Board imposed fines of $4,000. With the vice captain's surprise and anger at being given out when the ball clearly came off the pad, bubbled over into a reaction his skipper struggled to defend. The third umpire gave the Indian the benefit of the doubt. Well, that's very, very difficult to tell. The furious Slater fronted both umpire Venkat and then drive it in an incident which wound up the excitable crowd and will be further scrutinised by the match referee. It's just not cricket, but then again, that's exactly what it is. Peter Roebuck, perhaps the only cricket writer to rise above the level of Gilchrist smashed the Indians, reported that private school boys can be seen kicking and treading on the ball after unfavourable decisions and also insulting their opponents. Referring to the sport of cricket generally, he laments, The game has been taken over by opportunists and loudmouths. With respect, Mr Howard, political opportunism in appropriating Bradman's cricket is ill-advised. 1949 was a long time ago. Good night to you.